victim testimony is about to begin. Inside a brightly lit Santa Barbara, California courtroom, seated at counsel table, is the prosecutor, the detective, the defense attorney, and the defendant. He's dressed in an orange jail suit, smugly waiting for the victim to be escorted into the courtroom. She was discovered some 10 days earlier in a local motel room on a Thursday morning in October of 2014. The police had found an advertisement of what appeared to be an underage girl advertised on the internet to anyone who was willing to purchase sex. So they went to this motel room on a main street in our city, situated between two upper-middle-class neighborhoods, and they contacted her. She was in the lobby. They showed her the picture, and she said, yeah, that's me. And the pimp, he's up in room 208. And the police made chase, and they got him, and they arrested him, and here, we, here he was today in the courtroom. As the victim advocate for the district attorney's office, I escort the victim into the courtroom. She climbs up onto the witness stand. She settles in, and she prepares to tell her story. Not just the story of how she had gotten here today, but she would tell her story about how she came into the life as a human trafficking victim. The prosecutor is trying to set this up for the court. It's a preliminary hearing, so the idea is to present enough evidence to believe that a felony was committed. And he knew this was not going to be a small thing to prove to the court that this was a felony. So he begins questioning her about the life Ms. Doe, can you explain to the court what it means to be in the life, in the game, like you explained to the police? Well, sure. Well, that's like when you're doing dates for money, and there's rules, and there's people in charge. And Ms. Doe, when you say people in charge, who are you referring to? Well, like the bottom, like the bottom's in charge. The bottom, Ms. Stowe, can you explain to the court what the bottom is? <sighs> well, yeah, like the bottom bitch. She's the one that keeps the other girls in line in the stable. She sometimes posts the ads, she collects the money. I see. And is there more than one girl usually working? Well, sure, like, there's usually more than one girl working for the pimp, like in the stable. <laughs> Do you need me to break this down? I'm sorry, Ms. Doe. The court needs to understand this. <sighs> you all really should know this shit. And she was right. We should have known this shit, but we didn't. We didn't understand not only the terms and the words that describe human trafficking, but the faces of the people and the girls that were the victims of sex trafficking in our own community. And even working as a victim advocate in the district attorney's office for over 20 years, and interacting with lots of different victims of crime, I didn't know that this was happening in our own backyard, on a main street between two upper-middle-class neighborhoods next to a coffee shop that I frequented. And in fact, according to the U.S. Department of Justice, some 300,000 kids in the United States are being sex trafficked on any given day, 
300,000 kids. That is the size of Pittsburgh. And think for a minute what it felt like to be 12 or 13 years old. How impressionable we were. How much we wanted to be loved and accepted. Have people think we were pretty, boys like us. Well, that's the average age that a child is recruited into sex trafficking. And yet, still, as I talk about this topic with people, there's still misconceptions that teenage girls may actually choose this, actually choose to sleep with multiple, have sex with multiple strangers in bleak motel rooms all over our country, in often very dangerous circumstances. Really? Do you really believe that people, that teenagers choose this? As we came to understand this topic, one of the things that was, uh, was new to us in this thinking was that the pimps actually knew exactly what they were doing. They knew exactly who to recruit and under what circumstances. And many of these girls actually looked like and acted like your regular teenage girl. In fact, one day, I was walking down State Street here in Santa Barbara with my son, and we ran into Jane Doe. It was after the criminal trial, and we exchanged hugs. How are you doing? And we walked on. And my son said, Mom, who was that? I said, oh, honey, that's just a friend of mine from work. Oh, and we walked on. But Jane Doe, she had a story, and while unique in its own ways, it had variations on many, many other stories we would hear after. Her father was in and out of custody. He was a pimp as she was growing up. Her mother, when her father was in custody, prostituted herself occasionally to put food on the table. At 12 years old, she had her first unwanted sexual experience when a family friend raped her. She tried to tell somebody, but nobody really listened. And no report was made, and nothing was ever done. At some point in time, the foster care system got involved, and she was in and out of group homes and so forth. And so at age 13, when a pimp came along and tried to recruit her, she really couldn't think of anybody that could save her. She didn't, her parents weren't around. She couldn't think of anybody that could save her from it. So she said, you know, at some point I just came to accept, but maybe this was just as good as it was going to get. That maybe all I was ever going to amount to was a prostitute. That the best I could hope for was to find a pimp that wouldn't hurt me, who wouldn't beat me, a Romeo pimp. And then she started to cycle down into a negative spiral, she became exhausted, and a miracle happened. She met a man on Facebook. They started talking. He said all the right things. Told her how pretty she was. Said, why don't you get out of this life? Come live with me. Come stay with my mother and I. My mother has cancer. You can come here, you can live with us. We'll be a family. And she did. She moved. She moved in with him and his mother, and soon enough, he started trafficking her. He was recruiting her to write to her vulnerabilities. So here she was today in this courtroom testifying against the very person that she thought had saved her. She was conflicted. 
And the prosecutor, again, is still trying to paint this picture for the court. Ms. Doe, can you explain to the court what it was like? What was the worst thing? Was it lack of food, lack of sleep, strange hotel rooms? What was it? Spirituality. Ms. Doe, can you explain to the court what you mean when you say spirituality? Well, sure. I mean, like what I was doing for money. I mean, all my money was going in his pocket. All my energy was used up. I mean, I felt like shit. That's what I mean. I see, Ms. Doe. And did you feel like you were a hostage, like you couldn't leave? Well, like I said, all my money was in his pocket. I didn't even know where I was. I did not know where I was. And plus, I had nowhere to go. I had nobody to call. Where was I going to go? He had all my money. You know, we tripped all over ourselves trying to keep her from going back into the life as a sex trafficking victim. And she said an interesting thing. She said, you know, listen, I, I want to get out of this wor work too, this life too, but what am I going to do? Go work at Starbucks? work along other high school kids. I mean, I want to go to college. I want to become a writer someday. But people don't understand this. And I could run. You guys are, you know, making such a fuss, and I could run if I had $2 in my pocket. But I want something different, except, as I said, people don't understand how I got here and how hard it is to get out, and how dangerous. And as a matter of fact, the average life expectancy of a sex trafficking victim, in her case, having been recruited at just 13 years old, is a mere seven to 10 years. Seven to 10 years. So the likelihood that she'll be dead when she's 20 is very high of homicide, suicide, addiction, overdose, or disease. These girls matter. They really do. Now, I don't stand here with all of the answers, but I do believe one thing very strongly that she said to us, and she taught us a lot. You know, if just one person would have believed in me, believed in how precious I was when I was that 12 or 13-year-old child, believed in my capacity, I don't believe I'd be standing here today. I don't believe I would have been a victim and definitely not in this courtroom. So there are small things that we as individuals can do. Simply becoming a mentor to an at-risk child through a Big Brother, Big Sister program. Listening if a child says something's wrong, if they're acting out of sorts. Listening and empowering. And can't we all just think at that age, at 12 or 13, how maybe just one adult changed the whole trajectory of our lives. Or becoming a court-appointed special advocate. These are advocates who advocate for kids in the foster care system. There's an astounding 400,000 foster kids in our country whose parents can't care for them and a critical shortage 
of trained foster parents that will take them in. So, as I said, I don't stand here with all of the answers, but I believe firmly in the humanity of these girls, our girls, and that humanity is the casualty of human trafficking. <laughs>